Welcome to Season 4 of the Changing Earth Podcast with Sarah F. Hathaway. Blending survival fiction and fact to bring you entertaining education that will help you dream, survive, and thrive. And now, here's your host, Sarah F. Hathaway. Hello and welcome back to the Changing Earth Podcast. This is episode number 150, season 4, episode number 26. So I'm happy to have you back with me today. Um, a little bit better outlook this week. We're just we're just treading the waters and doing the best we can over here. So um, just taking a moment to enjoy a little bit of nature and try and uh, uplift the mind, you know. Uh, a lot of times uh, when I sit around, I pray, you know, I pray to just uh, bring bring God's light to the world and Sometimes it's hard to feel it. The darkness just wants to uh, close in upon you. But you know, you got to just look for the good in life. Look for those good things that are still holding you afloat and uh, try to dwell there. So that's what we're doing today. I want to remind you to head on over to patreon.com backslash changing earth. Patreon is p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com backslash changing earth. And check out all the goodies that I have for contributors over there. I'm always adding new stuff. And I'm really happy with how that process has been going. So I encourage you to get on over there and get involved so that you can get a hold of that great behind the scenes um, audio that I have for you guys. Um, The Las Vegas years is available over there. I've actually been working really hard on the the Lost Vegas years. And I have the second part coming out. It's at the editor right now, and it's entitled Daniel. So that gives you a little sneak peek into what's going on in uh, that the second um, installment of the Lost Vegas years. And that's available only for Patreon members. If you're not a Patreon member, you're not going to get access to that book, which covers the missing nine years in between Day After Disaster and Without Land. So head on over to Patreon. Check that out. I've also been diligently working on book number five to the series, and it is really shaping up to be pretty cool. So I'm really excited about that. Um, Long way to go still. You know, I don't anticipate it coming out for a few more months. But if you are a Patreon member, you get early access to that book at, you know, a certain contribution level. So you get a free copy of it as soon as it comes out. And uh, so I encourage you once again, head on over to patreon.com backslash changing earth and become a contributor to the Changing Earth podcast. So survival tip that I've been learning along the way is, first of all, thank God I've been storing, you know, lots of food and stuff to feed my family through this uh, financial difficulty that we're having. But also, you know, I've been working really, really hard on paying down credit cards over the past few years. And yes, we've had to use them a little bit here and there, but what a godsend it is to have them available that we weren't just um, spending willy-nilly and going crazy when we were financially, you know, um, on top, that we were working diligently, still minding our, our fundage so that we were paying down those credit cards and doing that. So it's really been a big benefit um, now that we hit this kind of financial hiccup. So I um, encourage you all, you know, we talk about future survival, but this is a little bit more current survival when a personal disaster hits you, you know, when you are doing well, make sure you're not just spending money all frivolously, you know, make sure you're paying down your credit cards and taking care of that debt. So that if you do hit a financial hiccup, you have resources to call upon. So last week in Battle for the South, Erica got rescued by Master Sar- or First Sergeant Bennett now. Um, you know, Bennett went in with Dexter and they got her and Vince out. So love that chapter. It's a really exciting part. This week, our focus is shifting more towards uh, Vince and Erica's recovery and also camp security. So today, I am super honored to have Brian Duff back on the show, and he is going to talk to us about home security, whether that be now or in an SHTF situation. So definitely an interesting interview. You're going to want to stick around for that. But first... Let's go ahead and get a word from our sponsor. It is the OWL Emergency Tool. And if you use the code Changing Earth Free Shipping, all small letters, no spaces, Changing Earth Free Shipping, you get free shipping on that product. So let's go ahead and get a word from OWL, and then we will get right into Battle for the South. Trapped in your own car, how are you going to get out alive? The only way out, break the glass. 
This credit card sized device shatters the glass with the snap of your finger. OWL uses a carbide tip and the resonant frequency of the glass itself. Your strength is irrelevant. OWL has a recessed razor blade that slices through jammed seatbelts instantly and comes with a holder that adheres to your visor. OwlOpen.com, proudly made in the USA. Order now while supplies last. Chapter 26 As dawn approached, First Sergeant Bennett triumphantly drove his truck back into Albuquerque. Eli was at a barricade they had erected. You had these men hustling last night, Bennett commented as he rolled down his window. How are they doing, Eli asked, indicating Vince and Erica. They're asleep in the back, Bennett answered. Feds gave them a nasty cocktail. Only way I could imagine anyone keeping that woman down, Eli commented, chuckling. You're right about that, Bennett replied. He left Eli and rolled the truck into town. Parking in front of the militia housing building, he saw Kyle waiting on the stairs. The man hadn't even had a shower yet. His dedication surprised Bennett. Did you bring them home first, Sergeant? Kyle asked, hopping to his feet. We sure did, Kyle, Bennett responded positively. They're a little out of sorts, but they'll sleep it off. Dexter jumped out of the back of the truck with a huge smile on his face. Trucker bounced behind him, sharing the young man's delight. Smith couldn't help but laugh at the two of them. The men worked together to carry the couple into the militia infirmary building. Kyle had reserved two beds for the incoming couple. Dexter Smith and Jensen headed over to the main housing building. They found a few available cots scattered throughout the sleeping bodies, and Dexter chose one. The young man was exhausted. Weeks of worrying about his family had left him drained, and now that he knew everyone was safe, he slept with his dog curled up next to him. Smith and Jensen followed suit, after relaxing a bit with some of the militia soldiers who were rising to start guard duty. First Sergeant Bennett, Eli caught his attention. Do you have a moment? Sure, Bennett responded, walking away from the doctor who was tending to Erica. I'm worried about the hellfire this might bring down on us, Eli commented honestly. Cassidy was going to send the electromagnetic gun we captured earlier over to Dallas to hold the city, but now she is rethinking that. We never intended to attract this much attention this far north. Did you see the jets fly over yesterday, Eli asked. Yes, sir, I did, Bennett replied. Even if they were just moving planes, you know they would have been surveying as they went. Now, attracting this attention with Vince and Erica, they'll know we're staging here. The radio chatter probably gave your location away a while ago, Bennett commented, even without the flyby. Yeah, but now they know for sure Vince and Erica are here. After the last federal governing board meeting, I'm sure the feds are itching to make spectacles of them, Eli suggested. You want them out of here, Bennett assumed? I do. Don't get me wrong. After the Southwestern Gate battle, they earn my respect. They are able-bodied fighters, and that woman works like magic on the morale of the soldiers. But, Eli countered his own argument. But you'd love for the chatter to start indicating they're somewhere else, Bennett suggested. You got it, Eli smiled. What about you, sir? We could really use someone with your command experience. I go with them, Bennett announced sharply, to the dismay of Eli. Don't worry, Eli. The Lieutenant General is sending Major General Chan Lee your way, with a thousand mercenary soldiers. I wouldn't worry about Dallas too much either. Colonel Chuck Stone was stationed there and should be back in command of the mercenary army there by now. From what I understand, the feds were caught off guard by the militia and didn't have time to strip the Fort Worth base like they did the ones here. Eli's thick brow line unfurrowed from its concerned position. Well, sir, that's some of the best news I've heard all day, Eli announced. And the day is still young, Bennett responded as jovially as he knew how. He headed back into the building, thinking he would try to get some rest himself. The room was bustling with injured soldiers and attending nurses and doctors. Bennett knew he couldn't sleep with all the activity going on. He chose a chair and set it up by Erica's bed. He stared at her, lost in thought. She slept peacefully. Her left eye was slightly swollen. Under that, she had eight stitches that were still fresh and had started to bleed a little again. Her long brown hair was dirty and stretched across the pillow. He thought back to the day he had met her, a little spitfire that had organized a rebellion at the refugee camp after the infertilization law had been put in place. She had never seen his face. 
A black hood had smothered her as she sat in a metal box in the Las Vegas detention center. The heat in the building alone had caused him to sweat profusely as he bantered her over and over day after day about fitting into the new system. He thought he could break her quickly and move on to the next rebel not falling into line. Not Erica Moore. It had taken a week to get her to crack enough to be allowed out of the box and get placed into a metal cell. He continued the barrage to the hooded figure, confident he could extinguish her fire. She had smoldered it enough to tell him what he wanted to hear, and she was slowly allowed back into the refugee general population. Years later, her family group had remained obstinate, and they were never adopted by landowners. Matthew Tweed, the manager of the Las Vegas Refugee Center, saw them as a drain on resources. However, her family group's list of applicable skills was very impressive, and they were chosen to form a rescue squad. Concerned about Erica Moore's past record, her team had been put under his command for training. He was sure he would break her then, but he never did. He tried to get her to follow orders, but she was always questioning, analyzing, and outperforming what he expected of her. She was going to lead the team, so Bennett had extra time to mold her every afternoon. He thought back to a day in the rain. He remembered the relentless shower as it poured down and soaked them to the bone. Erica's hands were raw as he had her hit a heavy bag over and over. He was trying to get her to change her technique. It was a safer method of punching, but he was really just trying to break her and get her to do as she was told without question. He chuckled as he remembered her hitting the bag so hard that it flew back and took him off his feet. He landed hard in the mud and was not happy. The truth came out that day. Trying to break her, he had broken himself. He told her it had been him talking to her in the box. He told her how difficult it was to follow the outrageous orders the feds were issuing. That's when it had started. He knew he could change things from the inside. It would mean changing loyalties that he had cherished for a lifetime. But he couldn't support this new system any longer. He slowly infiltrated the resistance movement and was put in touch with Cassidy's father. Bennett was to stay put and relay tactical information to them. The day Erica's squad left, he knew they would be headed into the town that Casti and her father were in. They had done their best to remove any evidence of the resistance movement, but Casti and her father didn't get out of town fast enough. They had hidden in the shelter. Bennett had no idea the outcome of that day would end up like it did. Casti had arrived in chains, and her father was dead. To make matters worse, Erica's team didn't arrive home as scheduled. He had gone himself to find them. Their sergeant had been badly injured, but they kept him alive and were fending off a ragtag crew of marauders when he arrived with superior firepower and quickly dispatched the attackers. He fell asleep in the chair, watching Erica breathe and reflecting on the past. Only God knew where the future would take them, but he would be there to protect her and her family. Bennett falls asleep watching over Erica and the camp's defenses are tightened. Here to talk to us today about home security is Brian Duff. Brian is the host of Mind for Survival podcast. He is the go-to resource for concerned people who want to improve their safety, security, and preparedness. He's a proud former Army Ranger, paramedic, firefighter, high threat security specialist, and international security director who has served and protected people around the globe for decades. When he's not working to help others, he can be found in the garage, tinkering away, out on the hiking trail, or meeting up with friends and occasionally trying to find the end of the internet. Make the choice. Take a look at Brian's virtual home, mindforsurvival.com. That's mind for the number four, survival.com, and set yourself up to overcome and survive any difficult situation. Patreon members, don't forget to head on over to authorsarahfhathaway.com and check out all the bonus footage that I have from Brian's interview. So let's go ahead and welcome Brian to the show. I am back with Brian Duff. Brian, thank you so much for coming on my show. I really appreciate your time. Oh, thanks a lot, Sarah. I love being on here. This is great. Yeah, I'm so happy we got to connect this season. So looking forward to some future seasons of, of connection. Hey. Oh, yeah. And then uh, we're going to do California survival over on your show, I guess. Huh? I'm going to have to talk yeah. about surviving California. 
Yeah, I mean, that's an important thing, right? I mean, you're you're in a state that, well, everybody knows California. I grew up there, and so you're in a state that makes it difficult in a lot of ways to be a prepper, right? So I think it's important that people understand, one, that if you're not in California, you have it much easier than people in California, and two, how to do more for, with less when you're restricted like you are in some ways. It's true. It's true. Well, we're just hoping they split the state into three. That's even on the ballot this year, so come on, Congress, split <laughs> us up. We need a rule voice because it's so different. So anyway, anyway, I digress. Today, we are going into home security, which is super important. Um, Bennett comes back to Albuquerque with Vince and Erica. They were uh, taken prisoner. It was really cool part of the book. Like, <laughs> cool part of the book. And anyway, so he brings them back and they've set up like all these security defenses like overnight while they were gone. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what we can do for our homes, both now and in the future. So I live out in the country, you know, yeah, it's California, but guess what? Where I'm at, like I can see anybody who's coming on my road. There's only nice. one way in. I got the shotgun, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> nobody's really coming up my driveway unless they're invited, but um, everybody's not like that, especially in the urban areas. Right. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? I wanna go ahead and give people the link to Mind for Survival and all that before we get started, and then we'll just jump right in. Sure, thanks. Uh, my name's Brian Duff. I'm a lifelong prepper, started prepping in high school. And from the, before it was called prepping, it was we were survivalists and all this, and we were crazy. I think it's the crazies toned down a little bit, but we're still crazy, I guess. I but think what? We were just like outdoors people at that time. Are, are, that yeah. Was well, that was people. that, and uh, Aryan Nation was, they tied everybody in oh, together. And it was, yeah. yeah. And so uh, it's yeah. progressed. So I progressed along with it. But um, I start off and I, I was the Boy Scouts, Indian Guides. I was a lifeguard in high school. Got out of there. I became an EMT and a firefighter for a bunch of years in Southern California. Went off and decided I wasn't too into that. So I joined the Army. I did uh, a number of years in the Ranger Regiment Special Operations. From there, came back to California and hung out there for a while until I kind of got fed up with it. Left, yeah, went back. Yeah, exactly. Uh, went back down to Georgia, worked as a paramedic in Atlanta for a while, and then I got into overseas contracting, and I spent probably uh, about just over a decade in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Africa, and other places doing security and uh, tactical medical kind of work. And um, at some point I came, well, actually, while I was overseas, I started listening to Dale Goodwin's podcast. And I realized then that like, wow, this, there's, this is what I used to do as a survivalist. And this, it's this whole prepper movement. So that really got me into reading all the books and everything else. And now I came home and uh, I've been home for about three or four years now and decided to do the podcast. Been doing it about six, eight months. And here I am. It's, it's been a ball. The prepper community, like we've talked about before, is awesome. I love it. Like really, really enjoy the prepper community. So that's kind of, well. yeah, that's yeah. That's kind of the hugest payment of all for doing a podcast because it's definitely not monetary, but the network, the friends. I mean, I've been out and met Dale and Lisa in person because yeah, I, yeah. we formed such a friendship. I was like, you know what? I've got to come see you. I've got to meet you. I'm driving out to Texas anyway. <laughs> Looks like we're going through Colorado, you know. Nice. My yeah. husband was spitting fire because we got into a blizzard up in Salt Lake, <laughs> but I was like, we're going. We're doing it. So, yeah. yeah. No, That's it's awesome. People are so nice. The the prepper community. The prepper Prepper people are so nice. And I went to Prepper Camp last year. And ever since then, I've been on just a mission because it's so much fun meeting everybody. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm so jealous because I'm out here behind the Iron Curtain. It's a long <laughs> way to get to Prepper Camp, you know. <laughs> it's a long way. I'm like, man, yeah, it I, is. I just can't call. I can't haul that far, you know. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's get a little bit into home security. And let's talk about some of the big you know, some of the biggest considerations when we're talking security for our home, uh, you know, both now and if we're looking at a, a, an SHTF situation. So I'm kind of going to let you just take the mic over and uh, guide us through what some of those concerns are. Sure. Well, I think you already hit on it when you were talking about being on your hilltop, being able to see anybody coming is the number one thing in my mind with any security situation is situational awareness knowing the lay of the land around you, knowing the environment. When I say environment, I don't necessarily mean like, you know, hey, is it a blizzard in Salt Lake while you're trying to see Dale and Lisa? 
But what is going on? What's the attitude of the people around you? What what's happening uh, politically or or whatnot? I mean, in a post SHTF situation, you're still going to have to be aware. You know, are there a bunch of starving people coming out in your case? You know, coming out of Sacramento or San Francisco or something heading your way? Um, are there other groups of people who may not you know have those ethics that we talked about before that? Um, are coming your way or that might be willing to try to do stuff to take you. So understanding that um, is hugely important. Then doing a good risk assessment on wherever you're at, on each of your your family members, on yourself, on your home, and identifying your, you know, they have like the, the SWOT analysis, you know, your strengths, weaknesses, right. opportunities, and all that. Um, and when you do your assessment, using that information that you gather and forming a realistic plan. And when I say a realistic plan, sometimes as preppers, we tend to think in best case, I know we always think about worst case problems, but we tend to think about our ability to deal with them in best case, in best case scenarios. And I've never in all my years of firefighting and working overseas, when Murphy strikes, it's at the least opportune time and it's in the worst, you know, just it's, it's horrible. So having a realistic plan. And when I say a realistic plan, Having a plan that, yeah, it addresses the most ideal situation, but you also have contingency plans within that plan that it, that account for possible uh, problems that come up because, you know, it's the military always says no plan survives initial contact. So when something goes wrong with your plan, that being able to react to it and having other plans, maybe not you don't necessarily have to have written out, but that you think through. So when you're working on your situational awareness, as you go through the day and you see, hey, you know, if if I stop my car here versus stop it there, what could happen? And and kind of game planning things in your mind. So in a post SHTF situation, uh, my my bio dad who who uh, did a lot of years in Vietnam uh, in special operations used to say, hey, you always plan uh, plan for the ex- uh, or. Expect the unexpected and plan for the impossible. So if you're at your house and you think, oh, there's no way they're coming down this cliff, well, then you better have an idea because that's where they're going to come because that's what they're – the bad guy's job is to figure out how to get to you or how to do something or whatever it is in a way you're not expecting because if they go to the way you expect it, now they have problems. So, Mm -hmm. And then deciding on what your threats are and addressing those. So is it people coming to steal your food? Is it lack of water? You know, I know we talked about before about your well, how you have to really wash it. You know, hey, are we going to run out of water? What's the plan if we do run out of water? Food, all that. So that's kind of where when it comes to protecting your home, it's this wide array. Do a good risk assessment, come up with a realistic plan, and then focus on the individual threats and address them with contingency plans. Yeah, everybody, the hill, right? Everybody's like, well, you got such a great vantage point, and, uh, you know, you could be – you know, out there shooting anybody. I'm like, yeah, and there could be snipers out on those hills over there, and I'm done, you know, because you're standing outside. They have the vantage point on you, too. You have it on them. Sure. They have it on you. Same same way that you have to think through those things. So, um, yeah, and even though we have a log cabin, there's a lot of glass, you know. Yeah. So you got to plan for, you know, do we need plywood to put, right. put up? And then if you buy that plywood, well, you haven't used it in 10 years. Sure. That was or bad. you got to replace, right? Yeah, I mean, chicken wire or whatever. And you're in a log cabin or most homes aren't concrete. So now you have, you know, subject to fire, all kinds of things. Yep. Yep, and it's enough. it's one of the things when I was doing um, I did diplomatic security overseas for a long time. And one of the things that we did with that, and when you go into training, usually within the first day or two of training, they have you actually plan an attack on yourselves. Okay. Exactly. So here's what you're doing. How would you attack yourselves? And doing that can really point out your weaknesses and come up with the craziest ideas you can think of, and then you can see how realistic they are. But if you don't think in things like in terms like that, and if you think, oh, I've covered everything that I need to cover because now we're 100% good, you're going to have a problem because there's no such thing as a foolproof plan. Every plan is subject to having people trying to dissect that plan and tear it apart in order to do bad things to you and your family. Yeah, I would agree with that. And that's a good idea, too, to plan your own uh, own attack. Um, one thing that um, Rick Austin talks about, I can't remember what he calls it, uh, when you cut all your, your bramble and stuff to line your property with that stuff because you don't want to walk through it. They don't want to walk through it, right? So mm-hmm. it's a really good way to uh, protect the edge line of your property. Um, so sure. Anybody with property can, can do that one. Yep. But... Uh, so let's go through some of the steps um, that we could start doing with our home to make it safer now 
but also safer in an SHTF situation. So a lot of your security systems and stuff like that are not going to work if the grid goes down. You know, so that's going to be a huge issue. I don't know if you could put an extra set like in a Faraday cage or something uh, to keep you ready, but, you know. I'm yeah, I think I think that's important, and I think you're right on, you know, depending on the situation. And if it's one of these scenarios that we as preppers plan on that might be multi-year, a lot of that stuff is going to break. I mean, you're not going to have replacement lights. So my my view is, yeah, incorporate that into your security uh, posture and all that, but don't count on That's a nice to have, but at the root, you want to come up with what you're guaranteed to have because a lot of people go for, oh, I can use this and that, but – if it's going to fail, you can't count on it. So have it in there as kind of like the cherry on the cake, but you really need to have a solid security posture going uh, that counts on what you know is guaranteed to exist. So um, the first thing you want to do is you want to perform a risk assessment, whether you know it's a home personal risk assessment. And then when you do that risk assessment, and there's formalized risk assessments, people can download forms for it. But really what you want to do is you want to look at what do you have to protect, what do you have to protect it with, and what do you have to protect it from? So in other words, okay, I want to protect my, my, my family, my home, and my food supply or whatever the case may be. Um, then, yeah, water, uh, that's obviously going to be important. Then it's what do you have to protect it with? So, okay, you might have a dog. You have your family members. You know, you talked about putting, you know, uh, wait a minute vines or whatever you want to call them along the edges of your property. Just analyze what you have to protect it with. And then you're going into what you had to protect it from. So bad guys, um, other and wild animals, like you talked about the bobcats and the mountain lions, all that. Then you line it all up and you start figuring out which is the most likely events to occur from that. And one way you can look at how you address those events is the five D's of home security. You want to deter, detect, deny, delay, and defend. So deter is – you put those vines out on your property and the guys and gals that come up to try to, they want to steal your food supply or they want to get in your house and whatever. They're going to go, you know what? The house down the road doesn't have all these thorny bushes that are going to cut me to shreds. I'm going to go hit that house rather than, than your house. So finding ways to make people say, and really it's, it, you know, some people go, that's oh, kind of mean, I guess the more, uh, uh, liberal f people in society, but you want to make your home look less desirable than your neighbor's home. So they go mess with your neighbor. And if your neighbor doesn't do that, then it's their fault for not taking that into account. Um, back in Georgia, when I lived there, I did that. I had cameras up. I had, you know, my place looked like probably looked like a crack house to some people. I had cameras up, <laughs> had lights up and all this stuff. And I told my neighbors why, because I had gotten robbed. And if they didn't want to go address that themselves, well, that was on them. Um, then once you deter, you want to, the next thing you want to do is detect. Now, if your deterrence doesn't work and they come through those vines, you want to know about it. You want to know where they're at, where they're coming from and that they're actually on your property. So that's some, some measures you want to take into that, whether it's, you know, you can go on Amazon and buy, buy these infrared detectors, motion lights will let you know, or in a post SHTF event, dogs, dogs will bark when a threat comes around. If you feed those dogs, that's great because now they have now they take ownership of your property. They have their area. They don't want anybody else coming on there. They will let you know when they come. Um, then you want to deny if if they do get onto your property, you do or you don't detect them. Maybe you do detect them, but they're still coming. Then you want to deny them entrance into your house or whatever it is into your inner perimeter. So that comes with hey, how do you defend your windows? You know, you mentioned plywood before, uh, chicken wire, whatever on your windows. Do you put you know, rose bushes or other plants that might, you know, not be that comfortable to jump into holly bushes around your windows so they can't, uh, so it inhibits them. And one thing you want to do when you do that kind of stuff is kind of direct the people to where you want them to go. So maybe they won't come into your house because you have rose bushes and all this crazy stuff around, but you can't, you have to have ways for you to get in and out. So maybe you want to force them that way. And that's where you have your family defending more of, or whatever the case may be. Right. Funnel them uh, into an area. Exactly. Funneling. Yep. Then you want to delay them. So that comes back into the plywood, the chicken wire. Now, if they do get up to your house, you want to delay them from getting inside because that every one of the things in dealing with bad people is time is 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 time is one of your critical deals. So if you can increase the time and distance, if you can increase the amount of time and distance between you and a bad guy, that's less chance that something bad is going to happen to you. So if it's going to take them a while to come through your front door and there's ways to reinforce your front door, your windows and all that, then you're just buying your more, yourself more time to react. And lastly, defend. Now, if they're coming through that door, 
now I have to defend myself and this and that. So um, if you go through those kind of that kind of mindset, it will really help with with your home personal defense, both now and in a post SHTF scenario. And that makes sense, too, because the more that you do that stuff too, the more they have to struggle to reach it, the more they have to, you know, work. They're they're wearing themselves out while you're just sitting there kind of waiting and watching. Right. Exactly. I mean, they're. They're getting beat up going through your vines. Then your dogs might chew on them for a while. And, man, by the time they get up to your house, they're like, oh, man, really? And then, you know, then you're in there with your, you know, you got you got some, you know, taekwondo action or whatever you have going on in your house. And it's just – it's one challenge after another. And for – especially for an untrained force, um, just like a normal mindset kind of force – do every one of those challenges just decreases their morale and eventually hopefully they're going to go you know what let's just pack our bags and go home let's go hit go again let's go take care of that house down the road because this this sucks yeah. and it just it hurts I don't to do this anymore. yeah I just, I, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah this this isn't worth it that that bucket of beans and rice just is not worth all this effort well and that's what it always comes down to return on investment right so yep. how much do you have to invest to be able to get that whatever you're after is that a guaranteed that it's even going to be there by the time you get through all this stuff so exactly yeah exactly make, make the return on investment very very slim and you probably yeah. will, will get overlooked right 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 yeah. so um now what if we're focusing purely i want like some ideas uh for purely in an shtf situation so our motion lights would probably fail that's pre pretty much what <laughs> i rely on a lot around here um, we have our motion lights up. That way we know if there's a bear in the area, things like that, because the lights will pop on, you know. Sure. So then it's time to go start defending my ducks. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but um, so for me, so like when you talk about um, detecting them on the property, so uh, that's a problem with rural folks. We have bigger properties. So right. how do you detect, you know, on this whole spread? where you know people are at and things like that so um let's let's just get send us some deterrence and things that we can use yeah so when you're trying to detect what's going on you know you have a bunch of different options i mean you can go online and you can find they make these little uh they're kind of not traps is a bad word but little devices that you can put a tripwire on and the, the little 22 shells that they use for driving in uh nails for like you know high, uh, nail guns in the concrete you can get those little 22 rounds so that when they trip the wire, it goes off and lets off a pop. You can find, okay. uh, you can find uh, the uh, glow sticks. Now, some of those expire after a while and don't work right. anymore, but you can do the same. There's, there's actually traps with glow sticks. If you have night vision equipment, they actually make um, uh, glow, glow sticks that are infrared, so you're not going to see them when they break unless you have night vision. And it's really oh, amazing. You're looking out there. Yeah, you look out, nice. and it's all of a sudden everything's lit up when you got your night vision gear on, and you don't need great night vision gear to just, if you're looking to see if, hey, if somebody is there, you'll see the wherever they're at light up. Um, again, animals, uh, it's as simple as taking and, and stringing string or wire and hanging, basically you can hang tin cans, put some rocks in the tin can, or if you take a bullet casing and you just hang that bullet casing down into the can, when they hit that can, it's like a little bell. So all kinds of things like that, putting if you make it painful to come through your property, you might hear people cursing as they're stepping on sticks or uh, yeah. spikes or, or whatever. So there's whatever you can imagine, basically, especially in an SHTF situ situation, everything's on the table. So whatever you can imagine that will help you to know if somebody's there, man, by all means, have at it. Yeah, I had somebody uh, using the property, uh, you know, four-wheel driving on my bottom trail. Oh, wow. And I'm like, what is going on? So I'm like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a board put nails in it and bury it. Right. And then whoever drives across, it's going to pop, <laughs> pop their tires. Right. Yeah. And my brother just happened to be around and he's like, uh, that was me driving on the property. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, dude, I knew you it. Didn't pop, you didn't pop his tires. Did you? <laughs> no, I did. I, he was lucky. He was privy to when I was telling my mom about that, you know, cause I would have, I would have totally got him, you know, but, um, yeah. Well, and another thing you can do to detect people like in that case is put, either a log or stuff across the road that they're not going to necessarily drive over, but they're going to have to move. Usually when people move a log or something out of the way, they're not going to get out of there because human beings are lazy. We follow the path of least resistance. They're not necessarily going to think to get out and put that log back. Well, if you go down there at some point and Hey, the logs move, well, guess what? Now, you know, you got people coming on your property. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's one of the reasons. So, um, I, you know, we have different walks of life that come play airsoft. So I made all the trails, you know, 
And so now they like to use the trails while I can still go in between because I'm really small, you know. So right. <laughs> I can still just pop out of nowhere, and I know where all my trails went because I made them. I'm like, nice. okay, <laughs> here I am, <laughs> you know. That's uh, awesome. Yeah, so that's a lot of fun. But, you know, it's true. Get creative. Um, I like the tin can idea. I might rig up some of those for uh, Saturday's Airsoft game, see if yeah. I can't uh, th <laughs> trap some people and know where they are then, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's it's super simple. You just you string a tin can up. You you can take a, a like a empty shell case and like a, a AR shell case and a five five six or whatever, and you just hang that inside the can, and it makes it kind of like a bell. And they'll yep. ding ding yeah. ding. Yep, yep, I like that. Hey, you hear that rustling? I'll get them teenagers with it for sure. They, they won't notice. <laughs> I'll be like, what's this? Um, yeah, yeah. The other thing that you had talked about in the beginning was setting up like you're going to attack yourself. So right. that's, that'd be a great way to assess, like, where would they come through? If they did come through in that area where you're like, nobody's going to come through there, like you said, they probably will. It, that made me light up because I was like, usually they would never come down from the top of my hill. You have to work so hard to get up there to the very top. But what if they did? I'm never thinking about that direction. And so sure. that, right, is very interesting to so set up the areas and then maybe – put some extra security through there. Yeah, I mean, you can look at, like, if you go and research World War II and stuff, you can see a lot of big battles that were decided by people and troops going through an uh, area that they didn't think they'd go through, climbing a cliff or climbing something yes. else. Yeah. You know, I mean, There's you might lose a couple of people. There's that battle um, yeah. where they scaled that whole cliff. They came in in the boats, and they were actually further down than the, what they thought. Oh, it was D-Day, but it was a second advancement yeah. party that was trying to get the guns. That yeah, was, that was uh, Second Ranger Battalion. That's they're yeah. the Point Two Hawk, and they they scaled the cliffs and took out the guns. The Battle of Monte Cassino, they had the Brits went and climbed some cliffs. It was the Brits or the Poles climbed some cliffs to get at the main attack force, and you know it works. That that, that stuff takes some cojones right there. I mean, everybody's just blasting you off the hill, and you're going. Oh yeah. Anyway. I mean yeah. that is. Uh, that's phenomenal stuff. Um, they do the um, World War II raids show on History Channel. Have you yep, seen that? Yep, oh, yep. I love that show because it brings <laughs> in like a, like the video game kind of aspect of view sure. of it, you know, with the reality of it. That that is a great show. I, I yeah. love it. Love it's amazing. It. Yeah, they did the uh, Pegasus um, replay of like the gliders that came in to take that bridge and hold the bridge and everything. That right, was too far. Phenomenal stuff. Phenomenal yeah. stuff. So everybody better go watch that history channel, <laughs> World War II raids. That that's a really good show. And you know what really brings it to light too, and that's if you're here in the states or overseas. If you go to Europe, go check out some of those battlefields. If you're here in the states, and you get back east, go check out the uh, Civil War battlefields. And if you actually do a little research to find out how the battle unfolded, you'll be really amazed at how stuff happened. And it's about doing stuff that's unexpected. In in you know in the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, I think it was on the second day of the battle, um, the the Confederates were trying to turn the Union line, and if they could flank them, they would win the battle because then they would just run down the Union line and hit them all, in the, and they wouldn't be able to uh, stop them. Well, uh, I think it was Chamberlain. He, his guys were running out of ammo. They repelled attack after attack, and he finally says, all right, we're out of ammo. Fix bayonets, and it was the last thing the Confederates thought would happen. They charged down the hill in a bayonet charge, and they ended up winning this battle against just incredible odds. Because they did what wasn't expected. Yeah. Yeah. And so your whole flanking force doesn't even matter now because you've got them charging right at yeah. the main force. Well, yeah. and the next that, yeah. that led to the next day of Pickett's charge where instead of trying to hit the flank, they just threw a whole bunch of people and charged across the battlefield and just I think they took they lost fifty percent of the force well, uh, that, by the time they got there. So take a long time to reload all those guns, right? I mean that's yeah. the time and well, stuff. So if they it, just start rushing at you. And if you ever get a chance to go see Gettysburg, it's amazing. If you can, and you you can see from where Pickett's charge was, every Union gun on the battlefield could watch Pickett's charge. These this, I don't know how many people were in the charge, but this this big group of soldiers marching across a battlefield a mile long. It took it was a mile long march that they marched under fire. So oh. it's you know, but that happened because that attack, uh, previous attack, w was foiled by this the, doing the unexpected at the end of it. Yeah. Yeah, well, and Washington crossing the Delaware wasn't expected. Yeah. Right, about right. exactly. Yeah, that's the only reason why we got it. 
Yeah, so, exactly. Interesting stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I like uh, studying the history of it. Uh, maybe it's because I like playing video games too, so I like the first person shooter. <laughs> and so, like, we have like World War II games and stuff like that. Yeah, so well, really Call of Duty, I'm right? Yeah, right. Well, um, <laughs> Um, the modern warfare one is actually a little bit better where you can play oh, okay. double and then you can play like your world war two and everything. But then, um, the podcast gave me the opportunity to interview survivors out sure. of world war two. And it was right. just like, whoa, like boom, reality, right? These, you know, to interview these people on camera and it's just really emotional experience. And yeah. uh, so you go, Wow. First of all, yeah. my first question was, how did they let that happen? How did Germans, these very advanced, very smart people, how did they let that happen? So sure. that's what I'm studying because I'm, you know, equating it to what is happening in general society right now. Um, right. There's a lot of really bad stuff going on as far as eliminating genes and um, stuff like that that's going on. We're basically euthanizing the sections of people right now. So that was my first thing. And then how did you survive kind of thing? You know, what was right. the, and the stresses and that, like you want to make sure that you have thought about home security before you get hit with anything that compares to any of that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. No, you have to take into account your home security, wherever you move, whatever you do. And I tend to look at it from trying to prepare for just everyday life. I mean, is a super volcano going to erupt tomorrow? Yeah, it might. The odds of it, again, this gets down to the risk assessment. The odds of it happening are pretty slim. The odds of an EMP happening tomorrow, while they might be increasing, are still definitely slim. So it's the everyday stuff are the bad. I mean, a lot of people have had, you know, have been subject to crime. I had my house robbed when I was over in Baghdad probably about eight years ago now, and it was horrible. Now, they didn't take a lot of stuff, but what they did take was they rolled my gun safe out the front door with all my guns. And what do you do when you leave? I put all my family heirlooms, personal stuff in there. So they got everything really at that time. Um, but again, that was in a way it was my fault because I didn't follow through. I knew what my risks were, but I didn't follow through on addressing them because I took the path of least resistance. Like, ah, that normalcy bias. You know, ah. yeah, there, there, you know, there's like 100,000 homes around here. What's the odds of the mine? Oh, the one in 100,000. Well, guess what? The one in 100,000 came home to roost. Yeah, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal stuff. So <laughs> it was all about the risk assessment. assessment. Um, I cut you off on the SWOT analysis, so I just want people to know that that's the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Yep. Strengths, weaknesses are internal. Opportunities, threats are external. I yep. mean, I use those things all the time with basically whatever I'm doing. That's kind of where I start because I'm like, yeah. okay, then we, we can brainstorm the ideas and go from there. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Brian, why don't you let everybody know where to find you and we'll wrap it on up. Thanks. Um, you can find me at mine number four survival.com and I'm on social media. I have a Facebook group just like we all do. Um, I'm in a bunch of Facebook groups with Brian Duff on, on, uh, Facebook, go ahead and hit me up. I love hearing from people and talking to people. So, uh, yeah, yeah. you're super active. On Thanks. I'm Try just, to be. Again, it's, I, too, it's so much fun. Yeah, I know. I'm like, oh, Facebook. I just want to get on there, communicate with everybody, and be off there. I'm like, yeah. oh, That's I'm actually the smart way. thing to do because you, you right? can do a lot more that way. Yeah, yeah. Because I love hearing from everybody. Facebook is great for networking and whatnot, you know, but uh, God, you could just wrap up so much time in there. I'm like, they want new books more than they want to hear me on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're working on. So, well, thank you, well, Brian, so much for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Sarah. I was glad to be here. I loved it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brian, for coming on the show. A lot of great information in there that we can apply to both now and any kind of future situation that we might be faced with. I want to thank you all for being out there listening and enjoying the Changing Earth podcast, getting all the great information. If you love this show and you want to see it continue on into the future, go to patreon.com backslash changing earth and become a contributor. I really appreciate all that you guys do. I try to get you the best information I can and keep you entertained while I'm educating. And it's really my purpose in life. I really, really love doing it. So I'm asking you to go out and become a contributor to the show at www.patreon.com backslash changing earth. Thanks again for listening. And until next week, remember, dream, survive, thrive. Thank you for joining Sarah for this episode of the Changing Earth Podcast. 
Don't forget to pick up your copy of Day After Disaster, Without Land, The Walls of Freedom, and Battle for the South at www.authorsarahfhathaway.com. If you love Sarah's books and this podcast, please head over to Amazon or iTunes and let everyone know by leaving a review.